Welcome back. In this video, we're going to take a look at fertilization as well as implantation and the development that occurs following implantation. I've added timestamps to this video so you can skip through as needed. These include a review of female reproductive anatomy, the physiology of ovum release, fertilization and implantation, a review of trophoblast differentiation and function, and finally, a thorough look at chorion and placenta development. In this video, we'll start with a review of the anatomy of the female reproductive system. This is going to include the ovaries, the fallopian tube, and the uterus. We'll start by labeling the uterus, which is a large cavity in which we're going to see fetal development. Next is the endometrium, where we'll actually see blastocyst implantation. We have the fundus that sits at the top of the uterus. We have the uterine cavity, which again is this large space within the uterus. The fallopian tube, we're looking at isthmus, which is the inner one-third of the fallopian tube closest to the uterus. Next we have our fimbrae, which are the finger-like projections that come off of the infundibulum. These fimbrae are what are going to help sweep the ovum into the fallopian tube. The infundibulum is the outer one-third of the fallopian tube, and this is where we'll see the egg enter into the fallopian tubes. If we look to our ovary, we have follicles in various stages of development. The follicles labeled here would technically be primary follicles, which are heading into secondary follicles. For this video, we're most concerned about the mature follicle, which is going to be the follicle that's actually going to release the ovum. I talked more thoroughly about follicle development in a previous video, which I'll link above. But what we're going to see here is follicle stimulating hormone is going to be released from the anterior pituitary gland. And as a result, that follicle stimulating hormone is going to stimulate growth of the follicles until one follicle becomes mature. It's this mature follicle that's going to develop the ovum and release it when we have ovulation. As a mature follicle grows, we're going to see the release of luteinizing hormone, which is going to help with the timing of egg release. This luteinizing hormone will cause the release of prostaglandins and proteolytic enzymes, which will cause this follicle to swell and eventually burst, releasing the ovum. So as we can see here, this follicle is going to grow to the point where its membranes are going to burst and we're actually going to release that ovum into the pelvic peritoneum. From there, the ovum will float through the peritoneum until we have pickup by the fimbrae or we have that sweeping in by the fimbrae and we're gonna sweep that ovum into the infundibulum. Following release of the ovum, the corpus luteum will form which is made up of the decaying membrane of the mature follicle. Importantly, the corpus luteum plays a role in releasing hormones that are going to prevent menstruation from occurring until we have fertilization. So the corpus luteum will release hormones such as progesterone and estrogen. These two hormones are going to be important in increasing the size of the endometrium to prepare the uterine cavity for implantation. We're also going to see the release of relaxin and inhibin, which are going to prevent uterine contraction. Next, we can speak about fertilization. So after intercourse, we'll obviously have sperm entering into the uterine cavity, and these sperm will make their way into the fallopian tubes. Generally, fertilization is occurring in the outer one-third of the fallopian tube, so as the ovum is making its way through that infundibulum towards the ampulla. If a sperm is capable of penetrating the ovum and fertilization is successful, then we'll have formation of the zygote. Following formation of the zygote, we'll see initial cleavage, or we'll have our first cell division, where the formed zygote will split into two different cells. Following this initial cleavage, we'll have further division of the zygote on day two, until eventually on day four, we'll have what's called the morula forming. Following day four and morula formation, we see differentiation of the morula into the blastocyst. The blastocyst is characterized by differentiated cells. These include the outer cell layer, which are the trophoblasts, and this inner orange cell layer, which is going to form the embryo. Again, blastocyst formation is occurring around day five, and there's some important endometrial changes that are also occurring around this time. With progesterone and estrogen release, we actually see differentiation of the endometrium cells, and as they grow, we start to see cavity formation. And this cavity serves as an area in which the blastocyst can rest and implant into the endometrium. As the blastocyst makes contact with the endometrium, the process of implantation will begin to occur. Part of this process involves growth of the endometrium in order to encapsulate the blastocyst. Progesterone and estrogen are what are stimulating the growth of the endometrium. And as the endometrial layer grows over top of the blastocyst, we have what's called the decidua capsularis forming. The layer of endometrium below the blastocyst is referred to as the decidua basalis, and the decidua capsularis and decidua basalis play an important role when we start talking about the fetal membranes that develop over time. 
As the blastocyst becomes firmly implanted and into the endometrium and we see development of the decidua capsularis and the decidua basalis, we begin to see a complex interaction occurring between the trophoblasts, which are the green outer layer of this blastocyst, and the maternal arteries or the uterine arteries. These arteries have been drawn in purple here, and we can distinctly see the spiral arteries leading their way up into the decidua basalis. Another important change that's occurring here is we have differentiation of the trophoblast cells that live on the outside of the blastocyst. As we can see here, these trophoblast cells are differentiating at a rapid rate, and they're beginning to form finger-like projections that lead into the decidua basalis. As these finger-like projections continue to develop, they form small wells which are going to make up the fetal portion of the placental circulation. The cells within these finger-like projections are called syncytiotrophoblasts, and this just indicates that these are the differentiated cells that create these finger-like projections. While these projecting trophoblasts are differentiating into syncytiotrophoblasts, we also start to see differentiation of the baseline trophoblasts into what we call cytotrophoblasts. So all of the remaining trophoblasts that are encapsulating the embryo are now defined as cytotrophoblasts. One of the roles of these cytotrophoblasts are to migrate from the blastocyst into the maternal portion of the circulation or into our spiral arteries. What happens here is those cytotrophoblasts will actually cause remodeling of these spiral arteries, which are going to allow them to open up and form the maternal side of placental circulation. As we can see here, those cytotrophoblasts have migrated into the spiral arteries, and what they're actually going to do at this time is straighten the spiral arteries. This allows for engorgement of blood within those spiral arteries, and allows for a place for the maternal blood to pool in order to promote diffusion within the placenta. In order to finish off this diagram, we can label the straightening of the spiral arteries. We can now see the blood pooling as those spiral arteries are straightened. And we can also label the syncytiotrophoblasts. And again, those are the differentiated trophoblastic cells that form these finger-like projections of the chorion. Although I don't have it labeled here, the chorion is just a term used to refer to the combination of both those cytotrophoblasts and the syncytiotrophoblasts. Next, what I'd like to talk about is actual chorion development. So we're going to take the process that we've just outlined in our previous discussion and break it down further so it's easier to understand. So what we're going to show here is a blown up picture of an implanted blastocyst. These blue cells represent the circular ring of trophoblasts, which we now define as cytotrophoblasts as trophoblastic differentiation is occurring that surround the embryo. The next layer of cells that we can bring in are the syncytiotrophoblasts. Remember, these are the differentiated trophoblastic cells that start to form the finger-like projections that move well into the decidua basalis. At times, you'll also hear these projections referred to as the chorionic villi, as the chorion is a term used to define both the cytotrophoblasts and syncytiotrophoblasts in combination. As these chorionic villi form, they start to penetrate the area of the decidua basalis where we would find our spiral arteries. As the embryo continues to develop, what we start to see is further proliferation of these cytotrophoblasts. So what I'm drawing here are these blue cytotrophoblasts that begin to adhere to the spiral arteries. And this adherence plays a very particular role. We start to see those cytotrophoblasts pulling the spiral arteries apart and straightening them into straight arteries. As this process progresses, what we start to see is straightening of the spiral arteries. They become engorged with blood. And what that's going to allow is the formation of the maternal portion of placental circulation. So again, to reiterate, what we can see here is the cytotrophoblasts pulling those spiral arteries apart. We can see that they become engorged with blood, and they're close to but not meeting those chorionic villi, which are going to allow for the maternal portion of placental circulation. And this is ultimately how the placenta becomes anatomically prepared to perform functions such as protection and allow for diffusion of oxygen, wastes, and nutrients. To make this more apparent, we'll add in our fetal circulation. And what you can see here is the beds of maternal circulation, which live within those straightened spiral arteries, and the beds of fetal circulation, which live within those chorionic villi. Instead of being physically connected, the fetal and maternal circulation are placed in close proximity to each other, with membranes separating both. This allows for the diffusion of things like gases and waste and nutrients, but does not allow for the diffusion of certain toxins or microorganisms as they're unable to pass through the membranes associated with each of these layers of circulation. To finish our discussion, we can bring in the final developing layers of our embryo and label these layers accordingly. First, we have the mesoderm, which is the middle germinal layer of the developing embryo. The mesoderm will eventually differentiate into certain fetal elements such as muscle and connective tissue. The yolk sac, which is attached to the embryo and plays a role in early blood supply. 
We also have the amniotic sac, which is the innermost fetal membrane and will fill with fetal secretions to create amniotic fluid. We have the chorion, which is made up of the cytotrophoblast or the outermost layer of the trophoblasts for the blastocyst, as well as the mesoderm. Importantly, this chorion attaches to those chorionic villi, which are made up of the syncytiotrophoblasts and contain the fetal circulation for the placenta. It's important to remember that we'll have the decidua capsularis, which is the endometrial layer that's going to encapsulate the chorion, as well as the decidua basalis, which is the layer of endometrium in which these chorionic villi are going to penetrate. 